So thank you so much. And uh, maybe before the, the theme of sacrifice has come, we can uh, promote uh, an event, uh, uh, another event in two weeks from now, Monday in two weeks, in, uh, in the University of Haifa, we're going to have a conference on sacrifice. Uh, so we all invited, and Hamos is promoting that, so took the opportunity to uh, promote that. Our next uh, speaker is uh, Professor Stephen Kipnis. Kipnis? Kipnis. And if I got it right, you are a professor of the study of world religions, yes. professor of religion and Jewish studies, yes. director of, the ch of a Chapel House, and director of the Fund for the Study of Great Religions. Yeah. Oh, Many wow. big things, so I'm very honored. <laughs> and your uh, publications include Jewish Liturgical Reasoning, uh, 2007 Reasoning After um, Revelation, Dialogues in Postmodern and Jew uh, Jewish Philosophy, and interpreting Judaism and postmodern age. So all that, you know, many other things. So, and your title is neo thomist and neo maimodian reading of being of God. So, <laughs> Professor Kibnes, please. <coughs> yes, I was um, at one time a committed postmodernist, but I'm now a, uh, what do we say? Baal Shuva away from, or whatever you call it. I'm no longer a postmodernist. Indeed, this is going to be a completely uh, anti postmodernist, pre modern attempt to resurrect um, a positive theology. So I would say that uh, postmodernism was a, a radical continuation of the Kantian challenge to theology, whereby theological language was uh, declared out of um, bounds for the uh, uh, Western intellectual, since there were no warrants for it. Uh, only, only the phenomenal world could be addressed by reason. Uh, and those people who continued in theology were basically irrational or fetus or something. So. Um, I think we have uh, come to the end of that Kantian challenge to theology. And we've seen that the substitute for theology, which is the secular world and um, a, a theory of knowledge that limits knowledge only to the phenomenal world, uh, has not been able to produce the certainty that it was supposed to produce. I mean, so many of the great dreams of the Enlightenment has, have not been fulfilled. Uh, and I'm just talking about the philosophical uh, program of the Enlightenment, um, which uh, many people, for many w ways, have uh, been challenging since the Enlightenment. The major strategy of religious people after Kant was to say, OK, if we can't do rational philosophy about God, then we're going to move to certain subjective forms. So that's personalism, aesthetics, mysticism, some super rational um, other ways of talking about uh, God. And I'm saying, too, that that enterprise, starting with existentialism, has run its course. And uh, it is not at all um, strange that that the, the, the Kantian strand has um, ended up in, a, in the uh, celebration of radically negative theologies. Those are theologies uh, people like Elliot Wilson are doing, and Michael Fagenbach just had a book, Fagenblatt on a book on negative theology as the kind of form of modern Jewish thought. Um, of course, negative theology was started by Maimonides, um, and so, in a way, theology has always had trouble in Judaism after Maimonides because of his great stature. Um, but that, too, a, a negative theology where you can't say anything about God and anything that you think in your conceptual tune don't bring you to God. Uh, basically, what is it between that and atheism or agnosticism, let's say? So. Given these challenges of Kant, Maimonides, uh, it's very hard for Jews to talk theologically. Uh, and we celebrate that fact. 
And again, I'm saying, I would like to suggest that enough already with the we don't do theology. Because why? Because we're thinking human beings. Jews are, all of our Jews go to universities. They're always thinking, and they, they're conceptually oriented people, if they're scientists, whatever. They ask the big questions, and you're going to say to them, okay, you can ask anything about the physical universe, but you can't ask about God, because we have a negative theology. Okay, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. It doesn't make any sense. <laughs> And in fact, in my study of theology the last year, I am just, every day I find new transformative cognitive explosions because I think our theological tradition is so rich that, I, I, that I'm just blown away. Now, I, so I've been trying to find a positive Jewish theology. That's my task. And... Uh, I was talking to these graduate students at Harvard. I was at Harvard in the fall. I, don't want to, I hate to drop names. But I do want to say the best thing about Harvard were the graduate students, the post, or you know, you young people. I mean, incredible. The professors, no one, they don't talk to anyone. You know, if you're at Harvard, you're a professor. I am too busy. I'm writing my books. Excuse me. OK. <laughs> but the graduate students, they're brilliant, and they're starved of conversation. So I had these conversations, and this guy's these guys, a woman, brilliant woman, and a and a, uh, an, an Arabist, actually, who studied in Iran, said, have you looked at Neo Thomas' views of God? And I said, no, what's that? So um, basically, I started reading these Neo Thomas. So the, the, the figure is Etchan Gilson from France. And then there's a whole tradition, Maritain, Maritain it goes Rahner. It's basically contemporary Catholic theology. Um, but it's based upon the attempt. Aquinas was also a medieval, so he had to do negative theology. But in Aquinas, the Neo Thomas found, you know what, there's positive theology here. So I, so I read all this Neo Thomas stuff, and then I said, well, if you have positive theology in Aquinas, why not Maimonides? So that's what I've been doing. And I think I have something, you'll, you'll tell me. When I done, it's actually in the end very simple. Um, and so let me do it. Okay, to find in Maimonides a positive theology, we need to look at his interpretive writings of the Torah, rather than to his purely philosophical ones. So I'm going back to hermeneutics, kind of. He's not a great hermeneutic, Maimonides, but in a way he is a great one. We start our search for positive theology in the Torah with God's own statement of self-revelation at Sinai, Anochi, Adonai, Elohecha. When God introduces himself to Israel at Sinai, he refers to himself as yud He vav He, the tetragrammaton, the Shem Farash. Although God does not explain what this name means. OK, so it's Sinai, right? Everyone's there. And, God, and the first thing is, God says, Ani, Anochi, Adonai, Elohecha. Uh, what does that mean, that name? We all Jews know that the name is, is rather mysterious. He doesn't really explain it at Sinai. He just goes on and gives the, the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. But we all know that earlier with Moshe at the burning bush, he did explain his name. And that's where, that's where all this um, positive theology emerges from in the Torah. There's perhaps no piece of Hebrew scripture that is more theologically rich than Exodus 3.14. Indeed, Moses asked God for his name, and God replies, Echyeh, Asher, Echyeh. And then, as if to give himself a nickname, he calls himself, for short, Echyeh. God has given us one of the deepest expressions of himself that Judaism has. In giving his name as Ahyeh Asher Ahyeh, or Ahyeh for short, which Maimonides translates as, uh, I've just given in English, I am who I am, and I am, God is simply saying that he is being. Here, to use the language of Kant and Heidegger against Heidegger, God is making the primary statement of ontotheology. It is God and God alone that provides all there is within ontology, its basis for existence. 
And this means, furthermore, that nothing else ranks as true and real as God does. This is the fundamental claim of Jewish monotheism and of Christian and Muslim monotheisms as well. As a neo-Thomas, Gilson's positive theology does, does not so much represent a departure from Thomas, but rather a new emphasis on things said but not underscored. Okay, then I just explained that he's in the tradition of Don Scotus and St. Bonaventure and Anselm. And then I mentioned that as we look for a positive theology in Maimonides, I mean, you, you see that our own neo-Maimonidean medieval uh, Gersonides and then uh, Crestus and Albo all in a way gave us some elements of a positive theology. They, they recognized the problem of the negative in, in Maimonides. And then you even see some of this today in uh, our Maimonidean scholars, Menachem Kellner, Len Goodman, and even uh, Ken Siskin. Ken Siskin, as you know, is the great negative theologian, but even he has admitted that Maimonides, quote, has the foundation of a traditional metaphysics. Quote, what about the claim that God exists, that God is one and simple, or that God is all powerful? Do these not give us the foundations of a traditional metaphysics? Siskin answers his own question. The answer is, yes, they do. But he doesn't follow up on that. So I'm basically following up on that. Is there grounds for a traditional positive metaphysics in Maimonides? Using Gil Gilson as my thread. So I'm going to focus on six points in Gilson's positive and theological interpretation of Exodus 3.14. The first point in Gilson's positive theology is the primary revelation of God in naming himself. So I'm just going to expand on this a little bit. This is the assertion, the assertion that God is being. In philosophical terms, this is God's aseity. God's simply being there. This is the primary fact and first principle of all positive theology. God being there. Gilson begins by noting that Thomas declares that among all divine names, there is only one that is eminently proper to God, namely, I am. Thus repeating Maimonides, what Maimonides said. Although Gilson recognizes the importance of Greek philosophers, so of course we go back to the Greeks, as the origin of maybe this notion of being, he says, Gilson says, um, that it's not the philosophers, but it's Moshe, it's Moses. There is but one God, and this God is being, is the counterstone of all Christian philosophy. It was not Plato, and it was not even Aristotle. It was Moses who put it in position. As Gilson puts it, Moses recognizes that in the notion of God as being, there is an inexhaustible metaphysical fecundity. And through exploring this metaphysical fecundity, Gilson develops his positive theology. It is true, however, that the contemplation of the absolute being of God brings us to consider what is not God. And Gilson tells us, this brings us to the realization that God is absolute being, excludes all non-being a priori. This means that God is wholly unaffected by non-being, so that nothing in the world, which is the realm of partial or non-being, can affect or change, harm or hurt or destroy God. God then, as absolute being, is invincible, impenetrable, utterly dependable, to always be there as being. In his commentary in the Mishnah, in his first of the 13 principles of faith, Maimonides provides us with a summary of all the positive theology that emerges from the realization of God's being, as given in the first assertion of the Aseret Hadibrot. Anochi ani Hashem, Elohecha. This is Maimonides, and this is it seems to me a positive theology. Maimonides. To believe in the existence of the creator, that there is an existent complete in all the senses of the word existence. He is the cause of all existence. In him all else subsists and from him derives. 
It is inconceivable that he does not exist, for should he not exist, the existence of all else would be extinguished, and nothing could persist. If we imagine the absence of any other existing thing, however, God's existence would not thereby be extinguished or even diminished, for unity and mastery are only God's, since he is sufficient to himself, all else, whether angels, celestials, or whatever is in them or below them, needs him to exist. This first fundamental principle is taught in the biblical verse, Anochi Adonai Elohecha, I am the Lord your God. Okay, that's Maimonides. It sounds pretty positive to me. Now, the second principle that I get out of Jilson in Maimonides is God as being, complete, absolute being, Therefore, God is perfect. Since God is absolute being, God as I am that I am, is fully actualized being, endowed, as Maimonides says, with absolute sufficiency. God lacks nothing, requires nothing for his being, and seeks nothing to complete his being. I am that I am is then perfect. Maimonides says this in his discussion of the name of God, the subject is its own predicate. I am that I am. Thomas puts it this way, in God, being and essence are one. God then is perfect, but not a, not a perfect received, not a perfection received, but a perfection which existed from the beginning and always. OK, um, what else do we get out of this? God is eternal. Implicit in God's completeness and per perfection, as we just suggested, is God's lack of development and change. That's when we say God is being, we are also saying that God is beyond the ravages and effects of time. As Jillson puts it, given his perfect, unchanging state, quote, the very notion of an event would be altogether meaningless. God then is in repose. The eternal God is as tranquil as a tranquil ocean of substance, integrally present to himself. So you recognize all this kind of Aristotelian language coming back on itself. So it's certainly a Aristotelian drosh on I am that I am. Um, but of course, we're dealing with philosophers, so OK. Maimonides also recognized, as he says, that God is beyond time. And he says it's intimated and I am that I am. Um, absolute existence includes the idea of eternity, Maimonides says. And in his commentary on the mystery, he says, we are to believe that the one is absolutely eternal. Nothing existed before him. God is creator. If God is absolute being, and we know we are less than beings and depend upon God, then we must have been created by this God. Maimonides says, he is the cause of all existence. In him, all else subsists and from him derives. This is a logical extension of the notion that God is absolute being. All contingent being is dependent upon him. And Maimonides' metaphysics, it is important to note that as well as being created by God, existence is continually sustained by God. So that's, of course, the, the Jewish view, that it's not a deist view that God created the world and then went, went away or just contemplated God is needed at every moment to continue to sustain the universe, that which is non-sustained without him. Existence then continues to exist because God's being gives it its ability to exist. And this is a, uh, another uh, implication that the neo thomists uh, uh, derive. God is good. And of course, this is the basic assertion of monotheism. Not only is God perfect and eternal, God is good, and God is the source of all good. Here, there's some compatibility between Plato's good. However, Josephson argues that in Plato, the good compels the sort of subordination of the being to the good. Whereas for Moses, God's being is isomorphic with the good. 
In terms of Gershonides, God's essence includes the good. Maimonides points to us to a further biblical warrant. You all won't be surprised from Genesis. The book which enlightened the darkness of the world says, therefore, and God saw everything that he made, and behold, it was very good. Even the existence of this corporal element, this is Maimonides, low as it is in reality, is because it is the source of, uh, of is, is likewise good for the permanence of the universe. Okay, let me just say that again. Uh, even the existence of the corporal element, low as it is in reality, so this notion of that this God, good, and then we have the emanation, and that's the interesting thing about it, right? He adopts a neoplatonic view of emanation. So the lowest level of God's emanation is the material world, and there is in that the source of evil and death is likewise good for the permanence of the universe. God as good is the source of the promise and basis of the reality and truth of the goodness of the world. However, God's goodness as part of his eternal, perfect, and absolute being means that goodness is primary to all there is, and its opposite, bad or evil, is the result of the non-godly, the non-existent, the non-eternal. This, then, is the metaphysical argument for the non-reality of evil as a substance in itself capable of challenging God. Evil is not being in itself or a being in itself. In the words of Plotinus, the great Neoplatonic thinker, evil is the lack of good or the privation of good. So evil is a result of, of a confusion among multiple goods. God is the really real and evil is the not real. Okay, so that's the... Um, traditional view, right? And that because of God's goodness, we can then have faith in our lives, in our world, and in a providential reality. Existing beings and their contingents. The, if God is absolute, perfect, good, and eternal, then there are clear implications for other beings. Jillison makes the implications explicit. If God is being, he is not, he is not only total being, he is more especially true being. And that means everything else is also partial being and hardly deserves the name of being at all. Gilson quotes Genesis, for dust you are and to dust you shall return. Gilson insists on the fundamental importance of what he calls the corollary, corollary if God is being, all else is non-being. Indeed, he says that this corollary, corollary I don't get that the word wrong, sets up the central problematic and also the central terms of Christian theology. And I would assert that he's saying, what he's saying about Christianity is also true of Jewish theology. Jilshin makes his point here. As soon as we identify God with being, it becomes clear that there is a sense in which God alone is. If we refuse to admit this, we shall have to assert that all things are God. And this is precisely what a Christian or Jew or Muslim cannot do. This is not merely for religious, but also for philosophical reasons, of which the chief one is, if all things are God, then there is no God. Here we have a restatement of the biblical antipathy to all forms of paganism and all doctrines of pantheism or panentheism, which identify some limited form of being with the totality of being, or exalts a part of what is to the status of absolute being or God. As soon as we identify God with being and see his status as perfect, infinite, unchanging, eternal, all else comes into fo focus as less than perfect, perishable, changeable, and humans particularly so. And this is the human condition which Judaism seeks to respond to with the revelation of the Torah to Moses which follows the revelation of God's name, I am. Okay, so very quick, that was a quick summary. Just say a few words about the structure of theology that that establishes for Judaism. Yeah, one page. In the explication of the multiple meanings inherited of God's self-identification as I am that I am, 
we have the basic structure of traditional Jewish and Christian theology. This starts with the assertion of God as absolute, perfect, and complete. Since God is perfect in the origin of all that exists, he is worthy of our praises, and we indeed never praise him enough. That the being of God calls forth human desire and requirement for praise and prayer is the origin of all liturgical life in, in, in Judaism. Because God is perfect, he is also worthy of our idealization. We strive to be both, both closer to God as ultimate reality, and we strive to be like God in perfection and completeness. Thus, God establishes the meaning and purpose and goal of life. Okay, I have another thing here, but uh, if you want, I can stop here. No. Okay. So, the very first is the theological exposition. I haven't heard such a theological exposition for a long time. That's <laughs> a long time, I right know. We don't do this anymore. Yes, yeah, so please. Well, Christians, so I really love the part. Enough with the Jews under reality. What's that? When you said enough with the Jews under reality. Oh, yeah, right. It's yeah. really an important move today. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to hear more about Wilson and what oh. your, because your argument was stopped right away. So. Well, I just think Wilson is. Um, Fagin Black, too. Fagin Black, too. Yeah, all that negative theology. See, with Maimonides, when you read Maimonides, you know that, okay, let's put it this way, he believes in God. He so, he so believes in God that he doesn't even have to argue it. I mean, his arguments for, are fairly um, flimsy, but is isn't. So these guys start with, there's no God, there's no Torah, and we have negative theology. And then it's all negative theology. It's all, can't say anything about the ultimate existence, and the only thing you can say is uh, you can articulate um, words that don't really refer to anything out in the world, but so then it becomes like Eliot stuff. It's like poetry upon poetry that it's like a uberus that eats its tail. So it's der it's Deridian. I don't know it, what's gained by it. Like why, Eliot, you, you're devoting your whole life to it's basically nothing. I mean, maybe it's Buddhism, but then do, let's do Buddhism. We're not very good Buddhists, Jews. Let's be Jews. That's the other thing. Why can't we? You know, this is like this, this is our theology. It's not perfect, but no theological system is perfect. So, and I think that we undermine ourselves by moving either to negative or saying we don't do theology. We do philosophy, or we do, we do rabbinics. We do history, great history, and and Should we ever talk about God in the university? But this is Barry Lam, so yeah. Lam alone. You can't say that. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, hi. Um, I'm Yehuda Halper uh, from Barry Lam as well. Um, so I have a, just a couple of points or questions. One is a point, the other is a question. The, the first point is that. Uh, so you said that the Maimonides, I mean, you sort of said it passing. Maimonides came up with negative theology. Yeah. And so, in, in fact, we find negative theology in, in a lot of Kalam uh, philosophy before Maimonides. I even happen to have right here with me El Mukamasi, who uh, also talks about negative theology and has a theology that's quite similar, in fact, to, to the points that you uh, brought out about Maimonides generally. Um, but he has oh, a thought, he has a positive and a negative. Yes, essentially yes. In the same way, for exactly the same reason you said, ah, okay. he believes in God. There's one God, and you know you, you can argue about it. And there's a sort of imminent apparentness to God and God's being that shows up uh, in in this in this book. And I think this is true of a lot of Kalam. One of the things I think that Maimonides adds, which which was surprising you didn't mention, uh, which is the intellect. Right? Yes. The so, uh, which is certainly a positive theology, right? 168 right. and, and throughout, right? Everywhere you have my mind is... Yeah, I had that in there and it really, yeah, yeah. So I wanted to ask you... Yeah, the active that, intellect this. and, of course, I mean, we all know, yeah, right, so I just left that out. And, I mean, of course, that's the greatness of Maimonides. At the same time that he exalts the intellect, I mean, right, it's, it, that's really it. I mean, uh, you know, the tzadikim are the, are the smart guys, right? 
Um, they're not necessarily the holy guys. They're the smartest of the smart. But even they get to the point where they realize that God is beyond them. But that's a different negative theology than than Wolf, than our contemporary. They're, they're very thin. Uh, no, no, I mean it as a positive theology. I mean, he says, like 168, you know, God is akil akil umakul. Yeah. So he's, he's, you know, he's sechel maskil muskal, he's intellectual. I see what you mean. Yeah. That's, a, that's a positive view. It comes, you know, yeah. it's, it's clearly dependent on your fellow metaphysics. And then later, the people yeah. you mentioned, Ralph Wagen, Kreskas, and Albo, yeah. are also building off of this Aristotelian. Yes. Metaphysics, and it's it's a positive theology. There's no uh, no different in that sense. Yeah. Of no, theology. I think you're yeah. Especially because of Verowitz is the source for both of them. Right. Yeah. So agreed. I mean, I think that some people have said um, uh, Adam Afterman, we know him, you know, Kabbalah, Scott. He said that really negative theology, he believes, was was not that big of a deal in Maimonides' day with the, you know, once you get after Gershonides, all those people, that was really resurrected after Kant. He thinks it's a, a like a post-Kantian, uh, you know, Jew, contemporary Jewish theology by the, the uh, you know, the uh, Hermann Cohen people, and now you get Fagenblatt, da, 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 da. But in its context, that's another thing to say, in its context, Everyone knew that there was a relation between the positive and the negative. We will conclude here, <coughs> and we will also keep this a hand. It's a great position. Great panel. Go. Go. And, uh,